scripture reading today is God's Word is in Luke 6, 37-38. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure ye use, it will be measured to you. So be it. can't hear myself sometimes. Let's start with prayer. Father, do we, we do thank you so much for the privilege to be in your house to worship today, Lord. But this is not the church. The church is this body of believers that we have gathered here together, Lord. Each uh, an important part of the body of Christ with him as the head. And we just thank you for the spirit that ties us together, for the gifts that you've given each of us to serve, Lord. And help us to realize what you have given us that we have the power of God residing inside of us to do good works so that we may glorify you and that others may come to know Christ. We thank you for your word that teaches us to love one another, even those who are unlovable, because you loved us when we were even your enemies. We just thank you and praise you for the time that we can fellowship today, Lord, the joy and peace that we have in Jesus Christ. And may we be examples that others may come to know you. We just thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I entitled this Friends of Jesus. What does it mean to be a friend of Jesus? What does that mean to you? A friend. You know, I got to thinking about it. I always tell my son, I said, you can count your good friends usually on one hand. And, you know, there's reasons for that. Sometimes you move away and you had a good friend, but there's not there anymore and you just grow apart, whatever reasons there are. Sometimes something happens and the friendship gets hurt and everything. But think back, if you can remember, way back to say first grade or whatever. A friend was a friend if he sat beside of you in school, right? If you went out on the playground and got mad at each other because he stole your candy bar and you hit him and everything, tomorrow you were friends again, weren't you? Things weren't as complicated. We didn't worry about the things of this world, didn't distract us. But we're going to see today that Jesus says, You're no longer servants, you're my friends. We have that relationship with Him. That we have that intimacy. And you know, if we understand what God tells us about the body of believers, about our responsibility as Christians to one another and to the world, we would have a lot more than just five important friends because we would realize each other. We've been camping with Polly and Merle and spending time together grows that friendship. And I think I can probably add more friends to my list. And the more that I spend time with you guys, the more that I'll build those relationships. And see, that's what it's all about. Because one day, if you're a believer, we're going to glory for eternity, part of the family of God, His very child and friends of Jesus. We looked the last few weeks at Luke chapter 6, chapter 6 verse 27 through 31, at some of Jesus' commands. Then we looked the next week at verses 32 to 36 about some more commands. And then today we looked at Luke 6, 37 to 38. Christian living 101 is what I said to you. Basic Christianity. This is how we're supposed to live. But when we look at these at first glance, we think these are some tough teachings. But they shouldn't be. Because we've been redeemed. We've been brought by the blood of the Lamb. We belong to God. We are His very children. And He has given us instructions and commands to follow out in this world so that people will know that we're a child of God. Not that we do things even as the pagans do, but we do love our enemies. That we forgive those. That we treat people the way that we want to be treated. That we offer mercy and grace even when it's not deserved. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 39 and 40, He says, He also told them this parable. This continues on. A parable is a further teaching illustration, right? Everything that we just learned about, all these different commands and everything, he says, can the blind lead the blind? Well, of course not. 
We can take that when we get that example. That would be silly because both of them would be running into things, falling down, hurting themselves, wouldn't know which direction they were going. But why did he say, can the blind lead the blind, except that we are supposed to be guides to the blind, correct? We have been given insight. We have been giving sight. Our sight has been restored. And if we're filled with Jesus, then our eyes have been healed. We see the light. We are to act as though Jesus act, to be more like Christ, to be rich towards God. Back to the scripture, can the blind lead the blind? Will they both not fall into a pit? Well, of course they will. And we're talking about a pit of eternal despair here. The student is not above the teacher. Jesus is talking to His disciples. First He's talking to the crowds, if you read in Luke 6, and then He further says to the disciples, then He says to those of your disciples who are willing to hear, to listen, to obey. You're supposed to be the guides. You're not supposed to be greater than the teacher. But the complete opposite, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Our goal as Christians is to be like Christ. To use the power of God that has been put inside of us to be ambassadors to this world because Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us and He has left us in charge. We'll get back to Romans 12 soon and we'll see about the servant and the responsibilities of the servant. And we'll see about the servant who does not do what he should do with what the master has left him behind. There are two types of people there were those that came to Jesus just to get what they wanted to get out of it. And there were those that came to Jesus that wanted to be His disciples, to forsake all and to follow after Him. But even out of those disciples, Jesus said, those of you who have ears, will you listen? Will you hear the words that I'm saying? I say this to you so that my joy may be complete in you, so that you may truly understand and, and have the joy in this world that you think you have and material things, and created things. But the Father has so much more in store for you. He didn't just save you from eternal damnation, but He made you His child, His very child. In verse 17 it says, He went down with them and stood it on a level place. A large crowd of His disciples were there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal regions, around Tyre and Sidon who came to hear Him and be healed of their diseases. So what is your relationship with Jesus? Do you just want His healing? Or do you want to listen to Him and become obedient? Because as we're going to read further, the ones who obey Jesus are the ones that are His friends. When I was talking to Troy earlier this week, he said, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, whatever you feel led. He said, obedience would be nice. I was like, that's exactly where we're at. How does that work out that way? And by the way, my heel is broken. We got x-rays on it. And you see how I'm walking. God is great. He is a great, wonderful Father. We have a Father in heaven who loves His children so much. But see, when you're not in His will, not doing the things that He's told you to do, you can't experience that true joy and peace that He has for you. You're a child of God. Don't forget that. So the point is, is, are you a disciple of Christ? Are you longing to be like Christ? Are you following after His command? Are you giving to those that fall into your path? Are you being merciful to those that fall in your path? Are you being loving and kind? No matter how they treat you, no matter what they deserve or don't deserve, because your heavenly Father gave you mercy instead of the judgment that you deserved. Can the blind lead the blind? Of course not. So he's saying for you that are listening, you're to be the guides here. You know the truth. You've been enlightened. If you're not a guide, if you're blindly leading others by not following my commands, not only are they going to fall in the pit, but you're going to fall with them because you're not following my commands. Are you my disciple? Then you're the student. I'm the teacher. You're not above me. And your goal is to be like Jesus because He's our Master and Lord. Can you get the point? Can you see the parable? The parable is a further teaching illustration to everything else that we heard in Luke 6. Let's look at that again. Maybe we need a refresher. But you don't have it, Kim. But I'm going to start in verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say these things. Love your enemies. 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. Not to some of them, but everyone. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that also. And if you lend to those to whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But you who are listening, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. Because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And then he tells them the parable. If you look in your bulletins, you'll see I'm, I made this little image. So that's why it doesn't look as professional. It's a ruler. And it says give and there's a cross. To give as Jesus gives. Because Jesus said no greater love a man has than to get, lay down his life for who? His friend. And Jesus calls us friends. So that's our gauge, our ruler, our plumb line is Jesus Christ. And that's who we're supposed to imitate, to be like. So that when... Barnabas first found the disciples in Antioch. He said, wow, look at this. They are Christians. They are like Christ. And he was so excited he had to go tell Paul because Paul was the biggest convert that we've ever seen. From what He was t trying to stamp out the way, the truth, and the life. And he has to go show him and says, look, disciples are acting like Christ. So it was at Antioch they were first called Christians because of their behavior. And that is our goal, to be like Christ. So that requires obedience, doesn't it? We know that as parents. If you're ever a parent, you know the difference in your child being obedient, how you feel their respect to you, their love to you because of that. And you know how much that you pour out your wisdom, your love upon them. Do you withhold your love or anything otherwise? No, because God is merciful to those that even do not deserve it. But to His child that is obedient, how much more pleasure is that going to give the parent and Jesus God is called our father Jesus says our father who art in heaven a concept that the Israelites never understood at that time God was the father of the nation but they didn't have that personal intimacy so Paul says in Romans 12 which we just discovered therefore I urge you to lay down your bodies as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service it's logical it's reasonable it's what you should do because God loved you so much. He purchased you back, redeemed you, ransomed you from eternal death. So if we look in John 15, Jesus says this to His disciples, and starting in verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That means full. Cannot hold anymore. It's to capacity. The perfection of human life that we're looking for. If you do these things... Your cup will run over. You will experience joy like you've never experienced in anything else that the devil's trying to tell you you'll find peace and happiness in. Look at the movie stars. Look at the sports athletes. Look at just other people that chase after these things and never find the peace and happiness. And that's the world out there that does not know Jesus. And they need us to be lights and examples to them. So he says, my command is this. There's another command. And what is a command? We don't like to call them commands. We like to call them suggestions that Jesus gives us, right? But they're commands. That means that He's in authority. He has authority. All authority has been given to Him from God. And He says, this is my command. The student is not above the teacher, right? We're supposed to follow after Him to be like the teacher. My command is this in verse 12. Love each other as I have loved you. There's your ruler. There's your guideline. 
Well, how is that? Well, he's clear. Let's go read the next verse. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's the example. It wasn't to be kind to, to people or anything else. It was to lay down your life in service. That living sacrifice, giving it to God. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. Pretty clear on that as well. Friends. Verse 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And here it is again. This is my command to love each other. We know that Christians are known by their love, right? We know love covers a multitude of sin. So if we're not loving as Christ loved us, sacrificially to one another, whether they deserve it or not, then they see exactly what we get the three examples in Scripture earlier. Don't sinners even do that? Don't they give to people expecting in return? We have to be different so that we can be like Christ. We might be called fools. We might be scorned at or whatever, but they will see our love because we have the love of the Father. They won't necessarily understand it, but it will draw, draw them to God. That's what we have been appointed to do. Verse 16 says, I chose you. And appointed you, two things, appointed you, set you aside for this task, to be a royal, holy priesthood, to be ambassadors to the world, as though God was making His message of reconciliation through you. That's our job, that's our appointment. And He says, you'll be friends, you'll have intimacy. I don't call you servants anymore. A servant is bound to their master by obligation, by duty. But a friend is obligated to the f friend because they choose to out of love. Merle, do you think I'd be there beside you when you needed it? I think you would be for me. There's no obligation there because he is my slave. There's obligation because he is my friend. He wants to love me, be there for me, and I want to be there for him. There's intimacy and Jesus says, you're no longer my servants or bond slaves. You are my friends because I have given you what the Father has told me. So obey. So do it. Live a life that brings glory to God. Be different than the world. Stand out. And then your joy will be complete. Pretty amazing. But it's pretty clear also. How many of you remember Roger Staubach? Joe Montana, Roger Staubach. We won't say about that New England guy. But those other two are probably the greatest quarterbacks ever, right? I'm just giving David a hard time because he likes those giants. <laughs> but Roger Staubach in the 70s was a quarterback extraordinaire. Four Super Bowls in one decade. Pretty good. And he says that he had a problem with obedience because he's a quarterback of the team he's leading the team no he's not there's a coach calling the plays behind him Tom Landry and Tom Landry called every single play Roger Staubach didn't if Roger Staubach had to make an audible he better have a good reason for why he did because Tom Landry was the coach he sent the plays in Roger Staubach was supposed to obey because Tom Landry was his authority. Well, Roger Staubach said in an interview later that he struggled with that. But once he got past that and realized that he needed to be obedient to his coach, there came harmony, fulfillment, and victory. Now, if you can't apply that to a Christian life, I don't know what you can apply to it. Because once you get on the program and understand what God is trying to do for you, why He sent His Son to die for you, for the eternal riches that you can have now and today and forevermore, you won't experience that harmony, that fulfillment, and that victory. When we've been studying in Romans chapter 12, we got to verse 9 and it said, Love must be sincere. 
Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another, honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the, with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. There's where we're at in Romans. Isn't that a good place to be too? Practicing hospitality. You know what that means in the Bible? That's going far beyond taking Cora and Tro Cora, not Corey, right? Cora and Troy into our hearts and supporting them. It's bringing people in who are strangers into your home and treating them as your own family. That's what hospitality meant in that day. And that's what we're supposed to be as Christians. Loving one another so that they see that love through us. And we've got to be that out of obedience to Christ if we want to have that intimacy with Him that He calls us friends and He shares those things with us. That's what Jesus demands of us. And He is our authority. And if we are obedient and follow His commands, we are His friends. We know the Master's business. We're following in the footsteps of Christ. We're bringing harmony and fulfillment and victory to our lives. I'm going to turn it over to you. Let you go where you want to with it. If you want this, I got to strip her down. this on? Hi, Kim. <laughs> okay, so I guess we've kind of already been introduced, but for those of you who may not have grown up with us forever, um, I'm Cora. I used to be Cora Butters. My dad, Les Butters, and my mom's back there in the nursery with our daughter, Rena, and my son, Shannon, is here, and my husband, Troy, and we've gone to Bonners Ferry High School, graduated. We went to college in Minnesota, from there, we felt the call to missions, but we had a whole bunch of college debt. So God opened a door for us to teach in the Bush Village of Alaska. Um, we did that for seven years, and that's got its own whole set of stories. And then college debt was paid off, and the burden to go to the unreached areas of the world, places where people virtually had not heard of Christ, was still on our hearts. So we went to Thailand. Um, we are now teaching at Chiang Rai International Christian School in Thailand. Go to the next one. Yep, there it is. So you can see Thailand's in pink. And we're up in the north. Cricks is the shortened version of Chiang Rai International Christian School. Um, you can see Thailand's in Southeast Asia. This whole area is relatively unreached. Thailand specifically has 70 million people. 85% of them are Buddhist. That kind of um, leaves it a little vague for the other 15%. But there's a large Muslim population down where Thailand touches Malaysia. And where we're at, there's a large amount of animism. They kind of mix um, a bit of fear of the spirits with Buddhist practices and rituals, and it's all kind of synchronized together. Um, but the spiritual need there is huge. Um, education is an open door to be there and to share the gospel, to share the love of Christ, and it's really been a blessing to us. We've been there for three years now, and we just absolutely love it. So go ahead to the next one. This is our school in the background here. And I'll let Troy tell you a little bit more about the spiritual need. So the country as a whole is now at 1%. And two years ago, when I presented here last, it was 7 tenths of a percent. So 3 tenths of a percent is huge growth in two years for a country, especially what's considered the most Buddhist country on the planet. So there is growth that 81 unreached people groups, which many of them are immigrant groups that live, we would call them hill tribes, but they're uh, up in the mountains. Um, there is also the main Northern Thai people. They're at four-tenths of a percent, but they're part of that one percent. So that one percent is uh, significantly south of us. Northern Thailand and its many hill tribes are largely unreached, except for a couple that have, have just now had a church planning movement within them. Um, the guys you see in the picture 
Well, the front two are monks, and the other guy, he's just a volunteer helping the monks out. Um, I see them almost every morning when I bike to school. This is the road I bike. And they're either walking along or they're in front of some lady. I've never seen a guy out there. I don't know why, but there's always some lady or older ladies out there with incense between her hands, and she's praying to them or giving them money or giving them food. or They're trying to earn merit. They're trying to find some way that when they die, they believe if they're truly Buddhist, that they'll be reincarnated, and if they have given enough, if they've built up enough good works and merit, then they'll get to be something a little better. Now, they're already humans, so they would believe that they'd be reincarnated as a better standing in, in the social class as a human, and then one day they might reach enlightenment, where you would go to like nirvana, this peaceful paradise where you don't want anything. And that's the core of Buddhism. You don't want to desire anything. You don't want to desire to be with your family. You don't want to desire food. You don't want to desire a warmth when you're cold. You just have no desires. You're completely broken free from it. Um, you can kind of project that that leaves you a little bit hopeless um, because you just have things built within you. We can see it in the story of Adam and Eve that we are meant to desire certain things, among them God. So uh, the Buddhist system doesn't leave much hope, but Christ does. And so we're happy to be there to be giving that hope a little bit to those we're able to reach. Next. These are the ministry types that we see in the families we serve. We're primarily here, or in Thailand, to serve servants. We want to see families freed as much as possible and healthy as much as possible to serve in the ways that they can. So they have the language, they know the culture, they're in position to offer the gospel and to offer mercy and relief in a bunch of different ways. Um, the problem is it's a hard place to live, and one of the hardest parts is providing education for your children. Some people are very adept at teaching, and they can teach their own children. But even if any of you have been there or seen that, even if you're good at it, it's hard, and it takes all of your time. So some wives want to be in ministry alongside their husbands. We allow that to happen, and hopefully we're also preventing missionaries from burnout, meaning that they would eventually get so stressed and troubled that they might want to go home instead of continue to serve. And sometimes there's wisdom in that, but we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen. We've also noticed that the longer our school has been here, the tables have kind of switched. It used to be that there were missionaries that needed help because they were out of energy and a little bit burned out, and so the school started to help them. Now, the missionaries are checking out our website. People are noticing that we have a school in the region, and they're coming to the region because there is a school. So we're excited to know that the entire region of Chiang Rai and the northernmost point of Thailand is now getting more and more competent and called missionaries into the region that are reaching un unreached peoples just because the school is there. So they might be involved in Bible distribution, um, a group called YRAM now has an app that maps out all of the Chiang Rai villages and the city itself. And they are uh, groups of people that are going around distributing Thai Bibles and marking any home that takes a Bible. So we actually have a map of everyone who's received a Bible in that region. And we're working through, at least we as in YWAM, is working through getting a Bible into every home. So kind of interesting stuff like that. Discipleship, English outreach, the church we attend most often has an English school right outside of a major university. And these universities, their higher level courses are all taught in English. So if you don't have a grounding in English, you can't get a high level degree. So if you have a church with a English speaking school that also has English Thai services, you have a huge glowing draw right outside the gates of major universities. So our, our church takes advantage of that, as do a lot of missionaries that have English schools, and they get a lot of college-age students that come in and they hear the gospel through those, as well as some more traditional things, uh, campus ministries, house churches. We have some uh, Myanmar outreach, which you might know, uh, there's a family that's connected here that has done some work moving into Myanmar or Burma, whatever we're calling it these days and uh, trying to work with Burmese people groups. We have people that do that also. The ones you might be familiar with is Free Burma Rangers. There are some other groups that also hike, somewhat illegal, but we know that Christ is higher than the laws of a nation. And he's crossed into a nation, right, into Burma, which is incredibly unreached and war-torn. We're connected against something called the Shan State, which is uh, some human rights violations, push people out of that region into Thailand. 
and they're involved in our life later. But these groups go in and they evangelize some unreached peoples in a closed country. And Thailand serves as a jumping point for many ministries all over Southeast Asia because you get 36 million tourists every year in Thailand. Getting into Thailand is not a problem. Staying is harder. You need a visa from the government and you have to have a reason to be there. So sometimes if you're working at, say, AIDS, HIV relief, or children's homes, orphanages, poverty relief, you can get a visa, but you have to actually be serving people, which is part of what God asks us to do. We're called to lay down our lives for our friends, to love our church. We're also called to care for our neighbor, which that's, the distance is big, but I think uh, Christ tries to elaborate on the idea of neighbor, and it's not just the person immediately next door, although I wonder if we've ever served the person next door. Uh, if you go across the country, though, across the oceans, then here's an opportunity through poverty relief to offer mercy to people and the gospel alongside. You can get into Thailand that way. And education. Education, you can get into almost any country on the planet if you're a teacher. You just find an international school or an international Christian school. And uh, the country we were looking at going to before Thailand opened up to us was Afghanistan. And you can go. You just have to find an open job. We couldn't find an open job, and God gave us an opportunity in Thailand. So, uh, quick break to say, throughout my life, the thing that has been the hardest in obeying Christ has been the very first step. Um, once I was underway, it wasn't that hard. Now that we're in Thailand, going back to Thailand feels very natural, easy, and exciting. Getting to Thailand the first time, very hard. Obedience at the very, very, very beginning takes intense bravery and boldness, and you just kind of have to jump. If you know it is healthy and Christ has called you to it, you just jump. So uh, we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. So the uh, other ministries, real quick, um, might be church planting, uh, pastoral training. There are two reach people groups, the Akka and Karen, and they have schools that train people to do ministry to their own people. And that's incredibly rare. So we're excited to see that. We love it any time people are reaching their own people with the gospel. Yeah. Can you go to the next one? Here's what that looks like for me. This is my sixth grade classroom. Um, these guys are all mostly 11th and 12th graders, the occasional 13 year old, or 11 and 12 year olds, <laughs> and the occasional 13 year old. Um, and I just teach math and science and a little bit of higher level math. I'm also the principal, um, I'm the IT director and special education director trying to give some jobs away. <laughs> that used to be okay. We had 100 students and having a few jobs was just fine. Now in the last three years we've grown to 200 students and having four jobs is a terrible idea. So I'm trying to find ways to uh, find capable people. We're always looking for volunteers. So all of our teachers teach for free. We're all in the same situation I'm in now where we're hoping that God will provide and he always does for his teachers so all these free teachers can have enough uh, money to put food on the table and fly back and forth to go home once in a while. Go ahead, next. Sometimes though, it's just being a principal, it's just being a teacher. Uh, this is the superintendent and I, we had to wear leggings. One day, uh, we got in a conversation with some ladies that thought leggings were appropriate. Uh, there are some cultures that exist in our school setting that it's just not. It's not kind to those cultures, it's not appropriate because of the cultural setting. And so we said no, and they said, well, we're gonna do it anyway, so we joined them. We wore leggings for, <laughs> for a day, and uh, then slowly they started to agree with us. So there's, sometimes it's just about doing a good job, and, and I encourage you that whatever job you're doing, I mean, I'm, I feel like sometimes missionaries get put on this high pedestal, like they're the special ones that can obey God, and uh, it's just not really true. Like I'm a teacher, and I teach, and I talk about Jesus. Like, that's it. It's not very shocking that a teacher would teach. In the same way, I hope whatever it is God has you doing, you're a janitor, you're a doctor, you work in an office as a secretary, it doesn't really matter. God has given you access to people. As you're doing what God has put you in, I'm hopeful that you're also talking about Christ. If you're doing that, you're a missionary. That's, that's the whole label. And some of your normal, everyday jobs, like teacher, get you into places where no one else can go. And as we're over here in Thailand, um, I'm spending time yesterday with my family who are largely unsaved. I can't be here to continue to have that one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face evangelism with them, but you can. You can. You can do whatever you are doing right now in Boundary County, and you can talk about Christ while you're doing it. And you can be a missionary to the people I cannot reach because I left. So as we're over here trying to serve and hopefully work with you for the sake of the entire kingdom of Christ around the globe, I hope you're doing the same here. 
I hope that you're taking very simple things, whatever God has you doing, and spend that time talking about Christ, build relationships that give you a chance to talk about Christ. Can you go to the next one? We also do this as a school. So sharing Jesus is the second, it's not secondary, it's first. We want people to know Christ. We want our own kids, ourselves, to know Christ well and for him to be the center of what we do. That's why we're serving servants. We serve these servants so that they can go out and do an incredible job of sharing Christ with people who don't get to hear that story. Anyone in this county could hear this story any day they want by finding a neighbor or going to a church with office hours. Not in Thailand. So we, we're, we're glad for that, but sharing Jesus is the core of it. So in our own lives, we get to do that through the school too. These are sixth graders at a Thai public school. Thai public schools invite our international Christian school for cultural exchanges, which we, we are happy to do if we are able. Now, more schools ask than we are able to go to because we also have to hold class. So we can't be constantly going there, but we do, especially at Christmas time, we do several. So public Thai schools invite us for a cultural exchange, and they want to know about some cultural piece like Christmas, which is so easy, right? We start out with the creator God who made all things and work our way through, oh, he chose the people of Israel, and out of Israel came the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and he gave his life away for all that have ever caused any kind of harm against another person or against God and have shamed their families. You notice we talk often about sin, and breaking the law of God, very true, but the culture over there is more honor-shame than right-wrong. So we talk about how shame has been brought upon us by the sin that we've committed, and Jesus rose from the dead, and one day he's coming back to get us, and he will judge all people. And those that are in Christ are saved, and those that are not, their own sinfulness will cause the justice of God to fall upon them, and that will last forever. We get to tell that in a public Thai school. And they invite us to do it. And we make it fun. We play games and we do skits. And the kids actually act out the story of the Bible. These Thai students act out the story of the Bible. And they get that exposure, a lot of them probably for the first time ever. So we love to do that through the school. We also uh, do it on the side. We have extracurricular activities, all of which are integrated with biblical living. So our school is 70% servant families. That means they are children that come from missionary families. That does not mean they believe in Christ. I can promise you there are children from missionary families that do not believe in Christ and even outwardly reject Jesus. So you could be praying for missionary families that they would reach their own children, which is very difficult if you're working in a ministry and it's taking all of your time or an unhealthy amount of it. Um, on the outside, though, of the classroom, the extracurriculars that I get involved in, I used to do student council, gave that one away, trying to give some more jobs away. I will keep basketball. I'm not dropping this one. I coach girls basketball. It's just a lot easier to coach girls than boys. So <laughs> I appreciate that. But the, the girls, this is, we call it huggle. It's a hug huddle. We get in one of these usually before and sometimes after games. We pray before the games. And I know that at least six girls out of my 18 are not believers in Christ. They pray with us. Together they see us play, and our value set is not victory. Although it's amazing that we somehow win some games when these girls cannot play basketball. They just do exactly what I say. They obey their coach, and it's awesome that they win some games. But through that process, they build this community, they build friendships, and those friendships provide an opportunity for students to reach students. We, we share the gospel with them, too. But the power of Cricks is that you have students above and below. You have teachers. You have community members. You have principals, all, that are living out and sharing the story of Jesus Christ. And they're doing it among people that don't know the gospel. So we've got these 30% Thai kids that are hearing this story. They're seeing the way we act and the way we treat them in sports and that we value them and we ask them to make critical decisions. We don't just tell them what to do until suddenly they're grown up, which is the Thai style. And we expect them to think for themselves, and it's fun to see that many of them come to Christ. This last summer, um, one of my basketball players invited Cora and I to her baptism. She's Thai and Australian, and so we're excited for her. She's the first believer in her family. Um, there's more stories kind of like that. You'll hit the next one. Thanks. And thank you, Logan. <laughs> if, if you've never been the tech guy, no one notices you, because as long as it's perfect, Everyone's fine with you. The moment you mess up, whoa, what happened, Logan? So thanks for being the IT guy. Classroom outreach 
is the place I probably see the most fruit. I teach science. Science, uh, the creation itself, is the second revelation of the character and the power of God. First being the Bible, but second, we can have a whole class on that, which is awesome. Um, our students also, in Bible class, get about 2,500 hours of biblical instruction if they are in our school, kindergarten to 12th grade, which is unreal, 2,500 hours. So if uh, we look at this group here, about half of them at this point have been in school since kindergarten at Cricks. So they've, they're at about 1,200 hours of Bible teaching. I wonder how many of us have had 1,200 hours of Bible teaching. It's pretty amazing. But even in science class, I get the opportunity to talk about why there might be a God. And it's very likely almost impossible that there isn't some kind of higher being. And, and through science, we look at the model that exists in the Bible and the model that's portrayed by modern scientific thought, and we compare evidences to them. We get to go through this, and a, a boy I discipled, he is the son of a Korean missionary family. They're in Thailand working with Chinese students because China kicked them out. They found out what they were doing and kicked them out of the country. Now they have to work with Chinese students at universities in Thailand. Their son, as I've tried to work with him and be a mentor to him, we get along really well. He has decided he has no connection with his family. He doesn't want to talk to me ever again uh, about God. And he started to do some self-harming, some cutting of himself. It's just, uh, I think, for this season at least, uh, the, he's chosen to accept whatever the devil's offering him. And that's hard. And we, we see that in families. But we still have that kid for five more years. Five more years of input, living in this community. He's going to continue to have a relationship with me. We're hoping that we can help this family to get to a healthy place again. But these missionaries, they need support. Their children need to be reached, and including, of course, the unreached Thai children in our classrooms. But the opportunities that we have here are unreal. I want to tell you about one guy. Can you go back two pictures? This will be easier. There's a little short guy right next to me. See him? He's like hiding down at my belly button. He is a northern Thai, true northern Thai, Thai, Thai mom, Thai dad. And uh, his name is Gus. His sister uh, took second place in Thailand's American Idol when she was eight years old. So she was playing a ukulele and singing, and she's just so adorable, people could not vote for her. So she's like a rock star and sort of famous. So they're moving. He left. This was his last year. Uh, so after he was done with our class, it was kind of a goodbye time we were having in a big circle in this room. And, Everybody's crying. There are several students that are leaving, some the country, some, you know, we don't know if we're ever going to see them again. And so just tears and over and over, kids are like, this class is like a family to me. Because they're all over the place. And it's hard for missionary kids, it's hard for these Thai kids to see people come and go so often. And uh, one boy was crying. He, he kept trying to say what he wanted to say, but he was too scared to say it. Um, that's part of obeying Jesus. It's usually really, really hard. Super simple, right? Super simple, just really hard. So he's crying, keeps trying to say it, gets scared and doesn't. And so finally, he says, I'm just really worried about Gus. That's the little guy. His name's Gus. I'm really worried about Gus because I know he doesn't, he doesn't have a relationship with Jesus yet, and he's going, and I don't know what's going to happen to him next. And he says this in front of everyone, and Gus, and all the sixth grade teachers. So it's this moment, and Gus is bawling and crying, and he's, he can't talk either. So he grabs this kid next to him, this American kid named Jesse, whispers in his ear for a while, and we just kind of all watch awkwardly. And then Jesse, Jesse says, uh, Gus wants us all to know that he's been getting up at 4.30 in the morning with his dad, and when he gets up that early, he reads his Bible, and he wants to follow Jesus. So like, and everybody, <laughs> I've been in a lot of churches, and I still can't get through the story. And <laughs> everybody just lost it, and we're all crying, and we, we put hands on Gus and pray for him. And I know his little sister, rock star sister, she's a believer in Christ now, and she's just like 10. She might be 11 now. And, and they are northern ties, four-tenths of a percent reached. Church planters are having a very difficult time among northern ties. Church planting's going well among hill tribes. Climb up in the mountains to this remote village and people are receiving Christ. There's church planting movements among two or three different hill tribes. But you go to the northern Thai people and they have been resistant for thousands of years. <laughs> Not quite thousands, I guess a little more than a thousand. They have been resistant to the gospel. They are still at four-tenths of a percent. And in my sixth grade class, I get to watch kids commit themselves to Christ because I'm a math teacher. It is awesome. 
I don't know a better way to use my life for Christ. I don't. I don't. So my encouragement to you is, like, if God's calling you to be a part of this kind of thing, get involved with us. You've got more than 40 missionaries on your back board. Get involved with one of them if you need to. And just get involved by yourself, right? If I can be a teacher and and it can open up doors like this, then, then what happens in your occupation? What happens in your job in Boundary County? I have no idea. I hope awesome stuff. Um, go ahead. Yeah, a little bit more. One more. The guy next to me, I'm on the far right. Guy next to me is Gan. Gan is also Northern Thai. He is a eighth grader this coming year. But when he was in my sixth grade class, he and his, this group of boys, they just kind of clicked with me. We got along really well. They had a little bit of the American sense of humor where they like to pick on each other. You don't really do that a lot in Thailand, but we could. They liked it, and so we'd mess with each other all the time, and we just got along well. Well, Gan um, decided, I don't want to tell too much of the story for the sake of time, but if I go back, he heard about Christ through a lot of different avenues on the Crick's campus, and then we talked about it in science a lot, and he loves science. So through science, he, he definitely believed that there was a creator God, and that Jesus is most likely his son and the Messiah, and then sometime... Last summer, a year ago, he committed his life to Christ, he says, on his own during the summer. He's just reading his Bible, hanging out with the guy next to him. His name is Wynn. He is the son of an Aka pastor, one of those hill tribes. So Wynn hangs out with him, and, and he decides he wants to follow Christ. He tells me that at the beginning of the school year, this last year. And uh, we had a youth retreat coming up, which is the event that we're at in that picture. And at that youth retreat, there's a swimming pool. Well, he found that out, so he comes to me and ask, uh, I, I think I want to be baptized. I, I'm, I want to follow Jesus. So I said, okay, and I tried to talk him out of it. I tried to tell him, do you remember when John baptized Jesus in the river? What happened next? He went in the desert? Yeah, things got really, really hard. And the devil himself came and tempted Jesus. And I tried to talk him out of it because I don't want people peer pressured in to baptism. I want him committed to Christ so much he's willing to suffer. So I was asking him, what if God called you to go to like some, maybe you went to Malaysia and they killed you. Would that be okay? It's like, well, I don't want to die, but okay. (laughs) So after all this conversation, he still wanted to be baptized. So we did. We baptized him in front of uh, the 7th through 12th graders, about 100 students, uh, of which many of them are also Northern Thai and not followers of Christ. So it was awesome in front of all those people to baptize him and the girl from Holland in the towel on the left and to baptize them there. And uh, he's continuing to follow Christ. Could you click ahead? And now this is my discipleship group of current eighth grade boys. That's Gon. He's a northern Thai with a peace sign behind me. Then an American. um, His name's Nikeo, which is overcomer in Greek. Uh, Back right is Wynn, who just moved to America for uh, probably a year, maybe more, so I don't have him this next year. In the back is uh, Atitawit, but everybody just calls him Michael because it's so much easier. And then on the left is uh, Tingyan, who's Chinese. So I get to disciple these guys, and it's a a super lot of fun. We go out, well, once a week we have lunch together, pray, study our Bible, and then uh, once every three months, I take them out on the town, and we go to the mall, go bowling, go skating, whatever might be fun, and then we talk about Christ amidst all that as well, and uh, it's been a blessing to me. So uh, discipleship, Uh, I used to have an older group that has now graduated. These guys will be my discipleship focus for the next couple of years, and uh, God's been awesome to give Cora some opportunities as well. So my primary job in ministry is to my kids at home, Um, but this last I guess it was about two years ago now God put on my heart to start praying for a discipleship opportunity with a Thai girl and I really wasn't sure where this was going to come from but no sooner had I started praying than less than a week later the pastor at our bilingual church approached me and said hey there's this girl her name's Jenny she's the only believer in her family she's only been there for only believed in Christ for about two years she wants to improve her English she's got a ton of questions about the Bible you want to disciple her I was like, okay, well, I think that's a pretty obvious yes since God had just been putting that on my heart. So Jenny's in the very back with her arm out, um, and we've been going through the Bible together. One of the most um, challenging but also amazing parts about our relationship is how we have such limited language connection. Her English isn't very good. My tie's even worse. And so when she asked me these tough questions, she wants to know about world religion. She wants to know about homosexuality, what to do when her friends go to Buddhist rituals. Can she go? What does the Bible say about what is Song of Solomon about? Like all this stuff. And so I, I can't 
eloquently answer her from my own speech. I have to just take her to the Word of God because I've got a Thai English Bible and we just read together what God says. And so that's been a gift to me to like learn, okay, this is really what discipleship is. It's it's just walking life together and bringing somebody back to the Word of God. Like it's not my opinions. It's not what I do. It's this is what God says about it. So um, we're going to continue meeting in the fall and um, I'm just praying she's the only believer in her family, praying that God will do a work amongst her her family and that he'll get her bold in her faith right now. She's very timid. That's partly her personality, but um, yeah, God's got a hold of her, and he's going to keep working. So that's been a blessing for me. Um, something else we've been blessed to do discipleship in, if you go ahead and click, is um, there's a village about an hour north of us that is a Sean village. And as Troy mentioned earlier, in Myanmar, there's a a Shan state and it's a people group who have been largely oppressed in their own country and many have moved into Thailand so in this Shan village there's a lot of poverty um, to overcome some of the poverty and even just to keep up with world status of having the big screen TV and also religious pressures there's a fortune teller there who to get um, a blessing from her or good luck they'll go pay her two thousand dollars which is in like the Thai equivalent is like a year's worth of money um, for good luck, for blessings. So with with all these financial pressures, they have succumbed to selling their daughters to Bangkok to work in the night industry. Um, It's kind of taken me a while to wrap my mind around how this works, but for them, as Troy mentioned, the whole honor-shame culture, they're bringing, these girls are bringing honor to their family by providing for them. It's very much a communal aspect of living and um, the families are okay with it because, well, this is what we need to do and you're providing for us, you're part of our family, you're bringing us honor by providing. It's, I don't know, it it doesn't make it right, (laughs) but this is part of what's been going on there. So um, there's a, a couple friends of ours who have been working in this village to provide education for these girls. And Thailand only provides education up through the eighth grade. So they've um, worked with Send International, who we used to be connected with, to provide scholarships so these girls can go to high school. And 16 of them are in this scholarship program and have not gone to Bangkok. Their families have allowed them to stay and continue their education. And three of them have even gone, gone on to vocational school. I mean, this is, this is enormous. This is a huge step. So we've been really blessed to be part of that. Um, we've gone up there once a month, help lead Bible studies, and get to know these girls a little bit, and they are just precious. We're so thankful that the Lord's got a hold of their hearts and is doing a work in their village. Then click. The boys have been a little bit harder to reach. Troy's tried to do some basketball outreaches with them. Um, there's only one that we know of. His name's Non, and he's following Christ, but at a different church in um, the same area. So we are continuing to pray for those girls and that God will get a hold of the men and the boys in that village to transform their lives as well. But um, go ahead and click. The, the thing that's amazing about this story is that, gosh, how long is this? So I think six years. We haven't been a part of it that long. We've only been part of it about two and a half. But for six years, these girls have been um, studying the Bible. They've given their lives to Christ. They have their own Bibles now. And they are leading Bible studies in seven different homes in their village. Six months ago, there was only one home in their village that was saying, sure, you can come tell us stories about God. Just recently, there's been an explosion of openness, and now there are seven different homes. And these girls, um, with the leadership of a couple other um, young women who are also Sean, um, they are going into the homes. They are leading the Bible studies themselves. They've been trained in it. I mean, it's really amazing to see them flourishing enough in their understanding of God's word and their boldness to teach their families and friends about it. It's really great. So this is actually something that we're going to be pulling out of for a number of different reasons. We'll still go up and visit, but not as regularly. Um, And we ask if you pray for us to pray for these Sean girls, too, that God would continue his hand of protection over their lives and that this whole village would be reached for Christ. It's an amazing movement of God there. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the what's next. If you um, want to know more about what we do we will have a sign up sheet for newsletters and prayer updates on the table back there but um, just to give you some quick ideas I've become the lead administrator of the regional women's ministry which is kind of (laughs) huge kind of intimidating but it's also been a real blessing to see how God is using this to um, 
bring us together in fellowship as some of the ladies there who were so often in our separate little worlds and involved in ministry and family, and we don't often get to connect deeply. So I do a, a lead a group of women who are putting together a once a year retreat, and then we're trying to do some worship nights with potluck a couple other times a year. And then I'm going to be helping with preschool in a couple different venues, one at a um, children's home near to my house, and then a preschool co-op, and I also do a library story hour. So those are things that are near and dear to my heart that I would sure appreciate your prayers for if you think of us, and Troy will share the rest. For you. Okay. <laughs> um, I have too many jobs, <laughs> and that's a prayer request. Uh, it means that our school is growing incredibly fast, and we love that, but we've always wanted to be a family school. We want to be able to connect with our students and their families. That means we can't turn into this giant factory with 700 students rolling through. Um, so we're at this weird cross point where we're almost at capacity. Actually, we were at capacity, and then God saw fit to drive over our school with a highway. We lost four of our five buildings through a series of about three miracles. We were able to rebuild a new campus, which is bigger, and we've almost filled it, uh, which is crazy. So we're thankful to God for the growth and that we're able to serve so many families and bring so many Thai families in, but now we're asking for prayer that we would know what's next, that I would know what jobs to give away and what tasks are mine to do from God, um, and he's equipping me for it, but the school growth is a tough one. Um, do we become a big school? Do we open a new school? Or do we say, this is what God has given us to do and we will do this job well? Uh, that would mean saying no to some missionary families because since they found out about us out in the... Uh, internet world. Now people are coming often to the area and wanting to reach unreached people groups in this, this whole region, Southeast Asia. So uh, we're a little unsure about what's next and we're praying through that now, but we need to decide in the next year. Discipleship, as we talked about, if you could pray that we would be effective in cha challenging these kids and having the right words and the right moments to share with them so that they would follow Christ well as, as well. Um, graduate coursework, I'm to be a principal in the school, I have to complete a bunch of classes, and they're taking a lot of my time, and they're hard. So if you could uh, pray for me that I would finish well. And then the adoption process, you talk about that one. Take that one. Okay, just real quickly. Um, we've always wanted to adopt, and so we've started with the Thai government, the adoption process right through Thailand, not through a U.S.-based agency, which the blessing of that is it's basically free. Um, the, the curses, we don't know. We're not like on, oh, number 10 on the waiting list. It's really up to them. And um, it could be a long waiting process, but we're done with our end of the paperwork and training, and the Lord knows. So pray for us, pray for our kids, and pray for our child out there somewhere who hopefully will be in our arms before too long. <laughs> All right. Could you, one slide ahead? Yeah, yeah, I think we're good. Um, we're having a little meeting. <laughs> So I was uh, hanging out with Shannon and one of his buddies, and we were, this is Shannon. Hey, Shannon. Hi. <laughs> we were reading a kid's Bible, and I get some of my best devotional time out of kid's Bibles, I think, because it's about at my level. But we're reading, and we're reading about John the Baptist and his followers coming to him and saying, everyone's going across the river to Jesus. And in short, John tells them, I have to become less important. He has to become more important. And uh, so I asked them, like, how do you guys think we make Jesus look more important? And Shannon's default answer, and it's the right one, is like, he's the creator. We remember he, he made it everything. He's God. So I was like, yeah, yeah. We, we remember that he's God and he's in control. We're, we're under his authority, as we've been talking about this morning. And then the other kid that was there, he said, obey. You've got to obey him. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's it. That's the whole thing. I mean, I, I don't want you necessarily... I just, I just, you hear the whole thing, but let me start this way. I don't necessarily even want you to feel like I'm asking you to pray for us or give to us or even care who we are. Um, but I am hoping that you will obey God. If the church obeys God, my family will always be well cared for. That's it. I don't, I don't need you necessarily to support us. If God is asking you to do that, if you feel like that is obedience to God, that would be awesome. Here's some ways you could get involved, and hopefully it gives you a picture of how to be involved in world missions in other ways, too. Go is the first one. You might need to actually go. Now, the scarier part is I'm not necessarily telling you to come across the ocean with me to Thailand. Um, you might need to listen to God, and as Paul says two different times, he talks about open doors. 
What are your opportunities? What are your obvious open doors? Your open door might be your neighbor across the street who you rarely talk to. What if God called you to bake cookies and cross the street tonight? Oh, that's too close, right? That's too, that's too close to home. You keep that stuff overseas. <laughs> no, it, it is hard. Um, yeah, I want to jump ahead, man. Can you go ahead until you find my driver's license? This is awkward, but whatever. <laughs> there, ooh, back one. There, that's my driver's license. I just got a new one because I forgot you need those in America, and I left mine in Thailand. So I, I go to get a new driver's license, and I'm waiting in line, and this lady goes to the sheriff office, the little booth there, if you've ever, well, you probably, hopefully you haven't seen it much, but if you've been there, she was talking through the phone and trying to fill out this uh, lost item report for the sheriff, um, and she had lost her wallet and was pretty distraught about it. And I immediately just had this impression, I need to pray for her. And I was like, all right, missionary, let's go pray for her. Got about that far. <laughs> Got a little closer to her. I was like, okay, you're going to pray for her? And in my head, I was like, here's what you're going to say. You're going to say, I'm sorry to hear about your wallet. Can I pray that God would bring it back to you? I was like, you're going to say that. I was like, here I go. Got a little closer. But like, there was fear. There's just always fear in me. Yesterday I was hanging out with my sister and her kids, my, my niece and, and all their kids. Um, and I, I wanted to several times say things about Christ. And every single phrase I spoke about Christ, there was this little bit of fear. And I don't know if you've had that. And I, I, I mean, if, if you don't have that, you're just not talking about Jesus. That's easy. But if you do ever, there's just this little bit of fear that comes up. And every time, I was like, just get it done. Just do it. I was even talking with, I think Mike and I were talking earlier about this concept of entitlement that we often put on the millennial culture, this newer culture in America. I think I would put it on church culture. I think I would put it on us, and I've been there as much as some of you, and I don't know if you're not there or whatever. That's between you and God. It's very easy in America to come into a church, plop down, let the, the actual guy who's supposed to obey God, because that's his job, tell you some things, and when he's done with his job, you go home and you go back to your stuff. And I think that's a kind of spiritual entitlement. Like, this stuff just comes to us. You look at those Sean girls. Can you go back to the Sean girls holding the Bibles with me and Cora? I don't know, I'm making, sorry, Logan, I'm, I'm switching it up on you a little bit. Oh, almost had it, one back. When they got these Bibles, a friend of mine is a church planter, of course, as well, church planter in Minnesota, and they bought the Bibles for the girls, and they presented, actually, just a little bit. We actually wanted them to pay for a little bit of the Bible, because we're not going to just give them everything. You have to earn it for it to be worth it. So they earned it, but they love these Bibles. They will never let that Bible touch the ground. That's how they carry it around most of the time. Tight to the chest. It, they take care of it wherever they go. If they put them down, they put them down on a chair next to all their other things. It's usually a phone and their Bible. And people will pick up everything and no one will touch the chairs with the Bible because they don't want to mess with someone's Bible. They treat it with such reverence and joy. And like, you know, I throw mine on the ground and I, you know, I still read it and have reverence for it, but it's just culturally, this concept of like, oh, I've earned this and this is mine. And I, I wonder if we all have that. I wonder if we have that sense of being what we, were de what we were described as this morning, a living sacrifice. I am a living, you know the hardest part about, it would be easier to be a dead sacrifice. What if, I mean, if, if someone came in here with a gun and you know, an assault rifle and they were just saying, okay, who believes in Christ? I'm shooting anybody who believes in Jesus. Well, we don't have to listen to him anyway. But um, it wouldn't be wrong for us to claim Christ in that moment. We die and it's over. You obey, boom, you nailed it, right? You know what's harder? Living as a sacrifice. You know what? It's, it's harder to get up on a Saturday and decide whether you want to bake some cookies and go next door and talk to your neighbor and have a relationship with them and share Jesus with them or just eat the whole plate of cookies at home. <laughs> it's a lot easier it is, but that's what living sacrifice looks like. Have you ever read the story of Abraham and wondered what in the world was Isaac thinking when they were going up the mountain? And how did a man, how old do you think Abraham was in the story where he's going to sacrifice Isaac? 110-ish. All right. So you've got a teenage boy versus a man age 110. Who wins that wrestling match? The teenage boy. How did he get tied up? and on top of rocks. 
how, how did a 110-year-old man tie up a teenage boy, get him on rocks, and then prepare him for sacrifice? I, I think the idea of a living sacrifice has been around since the beginning of the Bible. Since the very beginning. The very, very beginning. It's always been about living a sacrificial life towards God. And so does your life cost you anything? And I don't say that from some holy pulpit above you all, like the great missionary has returned. <laughs> it's, it's so ridiculous. Because again, uh, what do I do? The pictures showed a teacher who teaches, and I played basketball all my life. And the other pictures, if I wasn't teaching, what was I doing? It's basketball. That's all I do. And I talk about Jesus. This is not complicated. In fact, much of my life has been simple. In, in the beginning, I, I became a believer here. I was at the high school, Cora in tears, shared the gospel with me over and over. I snuck to what used to be Praise Church. I was wearing a shirt and tie. I looked like an idiot. No one was dressed up. It was a Pentecostal church. Everyone was in shorts and a t-shirt, including the pastor. I walk in with slacks, tucked in shirt and a tie. Everyone's like, you look so nice. Thank you for coming. I was like, I'm out of here as fast as I can go. <laughs> like, that was the beginning of me being willing to look at even if Jesus is alive. I, I, the whole church thing, this, what, what's going on here, was a foreign culture to me. You are a foreign culture to everybody over at that high school and a lot of people that live up Camp 9 and way up at Port Hill. You're a foreign culture. So I'm asking you to be cross-cultural uh, missionaries to these people. Take simple opportunities. I went to college. Well, actually, getting to college is a large part of why my mom came to faith. I had a full ride. All, my, all school was paid for at University of Hawaii in Manoa. It was Hawaii. I'm Hawaiian, so it helped. I got a bunch of money. But... Um, just think about, I could, I could have gone to Hawaii and been a civil engineer, and that pays six figures every year. That's a lot of money, and I get to do math and build stuff. It's everything I love. But then God started knocking on my heart after I decided to follow Jesus, and suddenly he's telling me, work with people, work with people, work with kids. And I'm like, it's not my plan. It's not my plan. I have this all planned out. And uh, by the end of it, I decided I'm going to be a teacher. I changed from a completely paid-for school to a twice-as-expensive private Christian college because he kept convicting me through the Spirit that I needed a Bible education. My mom says, you can't pay for that. I'm like, I know, God's going to have to pay for it. I don't, I don't get it. She's like, You're, this is not a smart choice. I'm like, I completely agree with you. <laughs> I don't know why it's happening, but this is what I feel like God is asking, and I'm just going to do it. It's a great slogan. I wish Nike would go back to it. Just do it. Just do it. Do the simple thing. It's hard. It's so hard, but just do it. It was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life, and here I stand with no debt because over five years in Alaska, God paid it off while we were doing missions work because God just takes care of his people as long as we're obedient to him. Then I go to college, and God's convicting me. You need to be in a ministry, and I heard that clearly, not like an audible voice, but it just kept feeling like I need to be sharing Jesus Help me find an open door, Lord. So I go to this campus ministries meeting, and all these people are going to come out and tell us, here's what we can offer you on campus. And uh, it was like homeless ministry. I was like, yes, let's do that. Oh, wrong night. Oh, I only have Thursday night open. Well, how about you could go street evangelizing? Oh, that sounds awesome. Let's do it Friday night. The only ministry I didn't want to do was prison ministry, because that, that sounds depressing and dark. And uh, the only thing available on Thursday night was... Life sucks for me. So I do prison ministry uh, over the course. The There's some hilarious stories. The first time I'm there, I'm looking at it, and I'm overwhelmed. The second time I go, second Thursday I've ever been there, and I'm this, like, 19-year-old uh, kid. Um, these, these guys, these men that I look up like these incredible giants of faith who deal with these murderers and rapists and talk to them about Jesus. The second time I'm there, they're like, oh, hey, Greg's not coming tonight, so uh, we're going to have you take pod 400. I was like, oh, pod 400. Who's 400? Like, that's the sex offenders. <laughs> so I get, it, I get in an elevator, and I'm flipping through the Bible, praying as hard as I can, Lord God, please let me pick the right page. And <laughs> I end up sharing the gospel with a whole bunch of guys. Through the course of five years, I enjoy this ministry so much. It was, it was maybe a tie for first and the hardest thing for me to leave when I left Minnesota. I wanted nothing to do with this ministry. God had to hit me in the face with, this is your only option. Obey me. And I led that ministry. It was, I, I led that ministry for three years. I was a chaplain at Ramsey County Juvenile Detention Center. And can you uh, flip a thousand pictures forward? And when you see a guy underneath a car, stop there. 
I under there he is. Okay, this is a missions website. Well, I got this Facebook message the other day from this random guy. I didn't know who it was. Um, he had long hair and dreads and a bunch of piercings, and you know, I didn't know who he was. And he kept telling me, like, hey, you know, you came to us, you were in the JDC, and we had these long conversations, and you talked to me about God when I was on suicide watch. Uh, so, so that means I went to a cell, and he was wearing, like, this big lead apron that he couldn't hang himself with. And I went in there and, and talked to him about Christ, and we prayed together. And he then sent this picture back. I wish I had brought it, but I, did, I don't have the picture with me. It's on Facebook. But it was a picture of the Bibles we handed out in the JDC. And it was, like, destroyed. The corners are all torn up. But he said it's, he's been reading that Bible ever since. It's like his Bible. It's this New Living Translation we gave him, but I, the second page looked funny. It didn't look like Bible writing, so I zoomed in, you know, and it was a handwritten note from Cora that encouraged him to read this Bible and to be faithful to what God calls you to, and then assign Cora at the bottom. He still had it. So he's telling me, hey, I've got five kids now. I'm an elder. I was an elder at a church in Minnesota for many years. I opened my own mechanic shop. I've been off drugs and alcohol for 10 years, ever since I got out of the JDC, and now I'm a missionary in Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> like I did, all I did was I walked in there and I told a story about a dead God who rose back from the dead. That was like it. I wasn't up there giving these long doctrinal dissertations on premillennialism. It, it just wasn't complicated. I went in and I, I basically asked people if they were sinners and they all generally agreed. Hilarious that in prison some people don't think they're sinners. But you, you go through that process and ask, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever hated someone? Have you ever wanted to punch someone in the face really, really bad? Yeah, I did it. Great. God calls that murder. So what do we got? We got a bunch of lying, thieving murderers. When God judges you at the end of your life, you're going to heaven or hell? Probably hell. All right. Is that a problem or are we good with that? <laughs> and then I'd explain how Jesus' death covers over sin. That's all I did. It wasn't complicated. I didn't have to stay up late night studying for it. Sometimes somebody asks me this great question, some really deep, insightful question. And I'd go back and I'd say, I just don't know the answer, man. But I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll find you something we can look at next week. And I'd come back on Thursday and we'd, we'd lay it out and we'd talk about it. But most of the time it was just a simple story of Jesus. So how did he end up a full-time missionary and a father of five off drugs and alcohol in Haiti? How'd that happen? Can you go backwards in time? <laughs> You're my man. I love this guy. Thank you, Logan. Actually, keep going until you see Romans 1.16. This is why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good story, or the good news, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Okay, next one. Just one ahead. 1 Corinthians 1. For the message of the cross is, say it, foolishness to those who are dying, but to us who are being saved, it is the, say it, what is the power of God? What does the Bible tell us directly is the power of God? Say it. What? We better go back. Let's read them again, Logan. I do this in my class, too. I don't answer your questions. <laughs> go backwards. I am not ashamed of the good story because it is the power of God. Go forward one. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the power of God? God's it's God's word. More specifically, it is the, message of the, cross. It's the gospel. It's the message of the cross, literally here, or the good story about Jesus. That is the power of God for salvation. People get saved because they hear a story. That's why you can drop tracks around. Someone will pick up a track, and you can go to websites online, and you can read how people came to Christ because they read a piece of paper somebody dropped. I used to drop tracks. Well, back in the day, it was IGA or whatever. But I would put tracks in pop can boxes because you can poke that hole where you in the handle. Just poke, the, po poke my finger in the hole and put a gospel track in there. And then whenever they got home, they got a gospel track to go with their beer. It was great. It was awesome. So I just pop, 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 one, two, three, four, five, and I just kind of do that when I went grocery shopping. Because the story is the power. Because I went across the sea doesn't make me somehow the power of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit exists in me and may speak the word through me. But if it is not that story, the power of God cannot, I don't, I don't want to limit God, but 
It seems to be God has limited salvation through that story. Even when somebody in a Muslim nation has a vision, who do they see in their vision? They see Jesus, the one who died and rose again from the dead. It is really not complicated. At what age do you think you can start telling a story? What age? Say it. 16 months. 16 months? You, yeah, right, right, right? And you're pretty much good till death, barring strange circumstances. You could pretty much write or speak or type. Type, I've shared the gospel in Alaska through Facebook with people, and I've had people email me back. I had this Muslim guy say, like, he came from a Christian family but became a Muslim for 10 years, and I had a conversation about science with him on Facebook, and he said, I wanted to let you know, three months ago I started going to church again with my parents, and I've decided to follow Christ. And, and not that I did anything great, he said, I just started the conversation with him, and he started the conversation with his family about Jesus again. I mean, I, I got on Facebook. How many of you have a Facebook account? Right? Oh, am I the only one? Yeah, okay. All right, all right, great. You now, you are standing on top of the modern Mars Hill. Paul went up to Mars Hill where philosophers were sharing their great ideas. I don't know if they're great, but I promise you, people are on Facebook sharing their ideas, right? And they love to talk about their ideas. So go talk to them about their ideas and then swap it over for spiritual matters. Talk to them about highly moral issues and then tell them where morality comes from. Like, it's just not complicated. So my encouragement to you is, if God is asking you, and I, I can almost blanket statement say he is, asking you to be involved in Boundary County, reaching the lost, what is your open door? What does he put you in right now so you can obey and that story, that message of the cross, can be the power of God? You need to also know that I made you say foolishness on purpose, right? Because that fear comes up and you're like, I'm going to look like an idiot, I'm going to look like an idiot, I'm going to look like an idiot. I'm supposed to look like an idiot. That's how that works. Right? The, the story about a dead guy who rises again, that's crazy talk, unless he's God. But that's the whole point. Right? You're supposed to go to people and tell this story that is true and you believe it at your core, you probably wouldn't be in this room, and then you look like an idiot to 80% of them. But... To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So yes, you will look foolish. You will look like an idiot. That lady had big wide eyes, but she let me pray for her at the sheriff's office. My, uh, my niece yesterday, she was talking about the kind of separating the divorce she's going through. And I said, I want to pray for both of you because you're both right here. I want to pray for your marriage. And so I, I got brave and did it and we prayed. And at the end, she's crying and she says, thank you. Thank you for praying for us. And and sometimes you don't look like an idiot, and sometimes God moves through his story. Sometimes you pray, and through faithfulness, for some reason, an almighty, all-powerful God works through broken, ridiculous people, like Galilean fishermen, like teachers, like secretaries, like retirees, like little kids. He doesn't care. In fact, he cares so little about how good you are at it, he's made an entire story called the Bible of how he took the most ridiculous people in the world and glorified his name through them. Israel is the most disrespectful, irreverent, rebellious people you could possibly choose. And he just chose Abraham, one old dude. And from old dude, created an entire nation for himself that at one time was the greatest nation on the planet, not because of their faithfulness, but because of his, right? And then Jesus comes to the earth. Instead of going to the temple, he goes out to the lake and starts calling fishermen to follow him. And if you keep reading in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul, hopefully not meaning to be a slap to the face, he says, think about who you were when you started to believe. Not many of you were noble. Not many of you were intelligent. Ugh, ugh. Don't say that to people. Not many of you were well-learned. He said, God chose you because you're weak to shame the strong. He chose you to be ignoble or low-standing so you can shame those of high standing, that you continue to be faithful to Christ. So I encourage you to most of the world to live so that you look like a fool for Jesus, that the power of God would save some, would save some. Because the next time I come back here, I want to hear people telling me stories about this guy you talked to once and then three years later he talked to you and I can't believe that happened and God is good. Right? God is good. 
He deserves our obedience. And I want to end with this. And I'm going to make you do something really awkward and uncomfortable. Um, how, how many ladies have hosted, had someone over for dinner in the last year? You had someone come over for dinner? You made dinner? Most of you? Okay. So here's the scenario. If you're not married, just make it, a, not your husband, make it a brother or a dad or whatever. But ladies, you have family coming over or maybe friends. They're going to have dinner with you. And you realize you're short one can of this, one bag of that, and you need some spice. And you send your husband. You write a little note, and you say, uh, honey, come here, please. I need you to go to the store and get this. And he looks at you, and there's just obvious love in his eyes, and he says, I will get these for you. And he leaves, and he goes to the grocery store. He gets to the grocery store, and he's having trouble finding things because he's never done this before. And he's looking around and trying to find help. He, he can't seem to find that can because there are millions of cans. It's just overwhelming for the, the male mind. And then he sees flowers. He sees all these flowers, and he sees Miss Dinning there cutting them up. And he thinks, oh, she's working so hard. I'm going to get her flowers. So he goes over. He picks out flowers. He goes to the register conveyor belt, pays for him, gets in the car, super excited to see you, right? He comes home, he comes inside, and he's got something behind his back. You're cooking like crazy, getting ready, right? And if you can, you know, you're trying to keep the kids out of the kitchen, and while something's boiling, you're out there sweeping under the table and all that. And then he comes in, and he wants to show his love and appreciation for how hard you work. And you finally see him, and you're like, oh, good, you're home. And he says, honey, I, I got you something in the store. She's like, great, I need them. And you... See these flowers. He hands you these flowers. And then your, they're your favorite flowers. Favorite flowers. And with all the love he can muster, he says, I am the luckiest man on earth. I am so thankful that you are my wife. I love you. What do you say? <laughs> do, would you even like? Do you not like flowers? <laughs> That's not the problem, right? I told you to do something, right? That's the problem. I told you to do something. I expect, and this, this is something we maybe don't get, at the core of love is obedience. It's care. It's responding to the needs of others because that's the core of what love is, responding to the needs of others. When Christ limits himself to work through the church most of the time, then if we really love him, we would demonstrate that by obedience. We laugh because it's a silly scenario and it, it's kind of cute in a way. But when we stand before Christ at the end of our life, will we have worshipped him by songs that sing as we did earlier today that I will serve you only with all of my heart? We sang that line five times we said it together. I will serve you only with all of my heart. And I wonder if we're going to show up at the ends of our lives and give him flowers when he asks for obedience. So if we love Christ, if we love Christ, do the simple obedience. The simple, hard, foolish-looking obedience. And I think we will be overjoyed. You talked about reward earlier, Alan, and that we are rewarded by Christ. The way he described reward is 100-fold. That doesn't mean rip it in half and then you know, rip this piece in half. It means doubling every time. For a math teacher in me, that's exponential growth. Do you know if you take a checkerboard with 64 squares and put a penny on the first square and then double it every square, in the last square you have over $1 million on the last square. That's only 64-fold. Christ promised you 100. If you start with a penny and fold it, as the term goes, fold it 100 times, you would be in the trillions of dollars. You would pass almost every country in the planet, at least in terms of their political budget. What God promises you is immeasurable. And what he asks is that we be living sacrifices. If that's with us, I hope it is. I hope it is. Then please, come talk to us. Let's talk about how you can pray weekly. I wear a tie every Tuesday. You can wear a tie or tie something on your finger or just get an email from me. You can pray with us weekly. You can pray with us every three months. You could give. We're about $200 per month short to stay over there long term. And we want to stay. We think God's calling us to do it. So if you want to be a part of that, great. Um, I think God's going to finish it in the rest of this summer. I'm praying. Um, if you want to go or you know a teacher, you know a teacher that would say, I want to work really hard for no money, then tell me about them. I would love to talk to them. Uh, that, that's kind of it. And then I would pray. I think you might be doing it already. 
just based on, you know, you've got missionaries all over your back wall. I hear your pastor talking about reaching people. As I am gone, please reach the people I love in this county while I'm gone. All right, just the simple obedience to Christ. Uh, I want to pray and I want to have you do something. Uh, so don't, don't leave me. After I pray, I'm going to have you do something. Lord, um, yeah, there's not a lot to say. You gave us the story. You've given us a Holy Spirit that does the work. <sighs> Keep us connected to you and give us boldness to go looking for our open doors. If it's cookies across the street, then give us boldness. In Acts 4, you sent Peter and John before the Sanhedrin and they told the Sanhedrin off. It's the most bold thing I can think of. And then you called them in Acts 4 to pray for boldness. So just like them, the, just like the apostles, we ask for boldness. Make us bold. Help us to be living sacrifices that never crawl off the altar and go looking for our own comfort in this world. We want comfort that comes from you when you come back to get us. We love you, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Before you go, I don't know if you realize it, but if you are part of the largest human movement that has ever happened on earth, there's never been more people involved in a single idea than Jesus Christ. Depending on whether they're honest or not, a third of the planet makes some claim to the story of Jesus Christ. And that's the largest thing that's ever happened in the history of humans. That story, you get to be a part of it. And I want to encourage you to encourage each other often to be a part of it. So will you stand up for me? And we'll kind of stretch our legs. We've been sitting way too long. Stand up for me. Here's what I'd like you to do. Will you turn next to, turn to somebody? You can say at the same time, somebody behind you, in front of you, wherever you want to go. If you need to move around, please do that. And tell them that the story of Jesus is the power of God. Do that now, will you? Yeah. Now I want you to tell them you, and you can, respectfully, you can point. In Thailand, you can't point like this, that's really rude, but you can use your whole hand. So maybe in Thai fashion, use your whole hand and say, you are a part of the largest human movement ever. You, you are now, because we don't want to have a plank in our eye, turn that hand around and I want you to look at someone while you point at yourself and tell them I am a part of the largest human movement ever. <laughs> Thank you for letting us talk. I, I just did. I just went over. I felt like <laughs> a lot over. So thank you for being patient with me. And we're going to hang around for quite a while. We'd love to just find out what your life's like. And if you do want to get involved, please let us know and we'll talk to you. Okay, and we're not done yet. We're not. No, we're not. And you addressed exactly, you're good, what I was going to address. Backwards. Again, go backwards, Logan, to his driver's license. And I can get all excited too, but they tell me to slow down because then I start talking fast and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, telling you about Jesus. <laughs> and they said, slow down. There we go. Same scripture, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Because see, the power of God came upon ordinary men and they went out and the church exploded. They got arrested. What do you think they were thinking at that point? They were scared for their life. They did not pray that take this persecution away from me or anything else, they prayed for boldness because all that mattered was proclaiming Jesus Christ because of God's love for them. Come up here, and we're going to pray over you guys. Okay? I don't know what God is speaking to you, but he's given us both the same message. Obedience. That's exactly where we're at in, in Scripture. Wherever we turn, whether it's Romans, whether, whether it's Luke, wherever, we're looking at obedience because that's what a child of God is called to be so that we can be friends so that we can be intimate with our Savior, so that we can live a life of work. And I am so thankful for your testimony, for your work. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, whether it's your neighbor down the road, like you said, or whatever it is, just be obedient. So if you want to come up, we're going to pray over them, and then we'll dismiss, okay? And don't forget that we're going to have fellowship and time you can talk to them about the different things and love on each other as part of the family of God.
place that you have set aside for us that Jesus is prepared and he stands there as our advocate. We thank you that it's going to be absolutely perfect. And then we're going to be your children, inheriting all that you have to offer. And Lord, that our life starts now as we